Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 108. Today our guest is Steve Hillage. Hello. Hi, Steve. This is Sean from Soul Night Live. Hello, Sean. Hang on, let me put on the speaker. Thank you so much for taking time to chat today. Um, I was looking forward to chatting with you, and I just wanted to first ask, you know, what you've been up to lately, and um, how are things going? Uh, right now, I'm working on uh, a major box set project for Gong. Excellent. That's what I'm doing right at the moment, where we're, we've got a, a lot of unreleased material that uh, we finally want to see the light of day. And but it's going to be a while before it's ready and before it comes out. But we have a, have a little taster of that coming out fairly soon. And before that, obviously, now we've just released the uh, live recording from 2006. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things I was calling about, and I was wondering if we could talk a bit about your memories of that event and um, what made it so special. Well, we I have a pretty good idea. I mean, it's a wonderful reunion, but I was kind of curious your memories of it. Well, it was, it was a long time building up to that. Um, <laughs> There was a 25th anniversary event in 1994, but I wasn't able to participate in that one. And um, but yeah, when, the, when it came to, came to the one, uh, the big one in Amsterdam in 2006, it was also very big for me because it was the first. I did a Steve Hillage band set as well, and that was the first time I'd played any of that stuff for. A, I think it was about 27 years, so it was a uh, quite an event. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what I've heard of the live album sounds fantastic, and I think you know it's going to be a real treasure for Gong fans everywhere. So that's uh, a... yeah. Well, the thing is, it, it it came out surprisingly well. The recording, <clears throat> and um, it was released initially as a DVD for the fans on a, on a rather limited scale. But that, um, the company that was doing that stopped, um, didn't restock it. So the thing was out of print for quite a few years. And uh, basically with our label, we decided we wanted to re-release it, the DVD, and also put it on CD. It had never been on CD before. Now it's on CD and digital as well as a DVD. And it's actually a really good recording. It's in really hadn't played together for such a long time. It's great. And am I right that, yeah, you hadn't played any of that material in over 20 years? You never did it like any of those songs in your solo I had, sets? I hadn't. I mean, the other guys had in various sort of forms, but I hadn't uh, played with Gong since, uh, well, the last Gong gig I did was in 19, December 1975. Well, yeah, way back, way back. Well, that's great that it's a document that's out there that everyone can share. Um, I do remember it being a DVD, and but it being hard to get. So uh, it's great to hear that it's going to be released again. Um, I highly suggest everyone go out and, and get a copy and check it out. Yeah, it's called Live at the Gong Family Unconventional Gathering. Yeah. That's what it's called. W did it feel as unconventional? And it's, quite long, it's quite a long set. It's a double CD. Yeah, yeah, it just brought everything you would want to hear from your tenure in the band is on there. And um, yeah, how did it feel working with David again after all those years? And how much did he change as a person, as far as you could tell? Well, I still remain friendly with David, you know. Um, so uh, I was sort of, um, in fact, when he started, um, doing gong gigs again in the late 80s for a while he was staying with us, you know, in London. He needed somewhere to stay. So, I mean, it um, didn't change that much. He evolved, but uh, as we all do, we grew older. But uh, it was like rekindling the flame, really. Yeah. Did he ever entice you to join gong back then 
Yes, he did. Well, he wanted me to do the um, be part of the um, 25th birthday thing that I mentioned before, the one in 1994. But that that was not possible for me because I was doing a lot of um, production projects at the time, producing other bands, and I just didn't have the time or the space to be able to sort of uh, contemplate something like that because. That concert we did in 2006, the big one in Amsterdam, the one that's on the record now, I mean, we spent a long time preparing for that, particularly me. I hadn't played any of that stuff, you know? Yeah. For a long time, so I, I really well, I really went into the preparation quite uh, seriously. Well, I could totally, I would do the same, you know, I'm a guitar player myself and you know, it's interesting sometimes playing music that you haven't played for 20 or more years. It's like, as a kid, I used to ask my guitar teacher, it's like, how easy is it to remember something from two decades prior? And he's like, well, often your hands remember it before your brain does. Did you find that to be true in some cases? Yeah, but I mean, some of it, we just, I just had to listen to the records and re- rework it out, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Not just the gong stuff, because also I did a Steve Hillage band set as well at that event. And things like, uh, you know, the songs like the Salmon Song and things like that from my Fish Rising out. I mean, that is, that's really difficult stuff on that. So I had to, I had to work hard. To, well, I was very glad I did. And, and of course, after we did this coming together, we then... Um, we then actually did a new lineup of Gong, and we did made a new new album with Gong 2032. Yeah. And so, so it was the beginning of a whole new chapter. And I'm I'm very much now involved with Gong, not as a so much as a player, although I still guess sometimes with the current lineup. But um, are working on um, producing um, all these new releases from our from our archive. Yeah, well, I, that's going to be a treasure trove uh, when it arrives. That's that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I actually saw you with the reunited gong at a festival in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania called Nearfest. Oh, Nearfest. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and your band as well. And that was what a delightful night, you know. I, I never thought I'd see the likes of it. So thank you for being part of that. That was fantastic. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I loved it. Um, so I was curious if you could talk a little bit about your early guitar influences. You have such a unique style. I've always kind of wondered who were some of the people that got you going early on. Uh, well, it was a sort of mixture of things. You know, obviously I, I grew up in the 60s in London. And it was a very, uh, special time for music, you know, there's a oh, lot yeah. of very rapid developments going on. And um, obviously I was interested in blues guitar once I heard people like Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton, and then of course it's Jimi Hendrix, who I was very lucky to see live a few times, which is a big influence on me. But um, I also um, was working, we had a group at school, I was working with a very good keyboard player called Dave Stewart. And so we got involved in some quite sort of complex musical um, textures and time signatures and things. So I wasn't just doing sort of like regular rock and blues. But another big influence on me, and something I mention quite a lot, is when I, I used to practice a lot listening to a John Hall train record called My Favourite Thing. It's not it's not a complete free jazz freak out sort of thing. It's a quite sober record, but it's beautiful playing and I love the scales that he was playing in a lot of it was in the Mixolydian mode or the Lydian mode and I picked up on a lot of that. And so that I think that's what gives me a rather unique Thing. I mean, I play quite a lot in sort of major Mixolydian sky, uh, modes, you know, rather than just pure minor blues stuff, you know? Yeah, that, yeah, I think that gives your music a, a positive fight, a feel, you know, it never wallows in this minor kind of thing for long. So, uh, yeah, I, I really love that. Um, 
And what what kind of guitar were you favoring back in those early days? Like, what was your first really good one? Stratocaster. Yeah. Did Hank Marvin? Yeah. Did Hank no, Marvin no, when make? I was fifth, when I was fifteen, I got a Stratocaster. Was Was Hank Marvin an influence on wanting a a Strat? I, I hear. Oh he... yeah, when I was from early on, I mean, uh, influenced everybody. Shadows when I was when I was a kid. You know? Oh yeah, yeah, I think suddenly everybody wanted a red Strat, and they were really hard to get, yeah. as I recall hearing. But uh, yeah. a few made it through. But of course, I mean uh, Hendrix played the Stratocaster as well, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, when you were relearning those Gong songs and just the shows that you did, what songs from that repertoire do you? really did you find you enjoyed playing the most oh i like them all but <laughs> obviously there's um, a particular thrill we always get from the the track called master builder oh yeah which we call, which we call the omri and it's quite a good version actually on the recording yeah, yeah, that's a great. That like, song has such a great riff and just the the vibe. It just sweeps you along in such a, a great way. Yeah. Really love it. Yeah. So you moved to well, that, that riff. Yeah, that just riff that just appeared in my mind one morning, and uh, when I just woken up, and uh, I didn't have my guitar with me. This is back in seventy four. I didn't have my guitar with me, but I had this riff in my head, and I thought it was fantastic the way it was actually in 4 4, but it didn't sound like it was in 4 4. So I, I got a pen and a paper and I noted it down what I had in my head, in sort of musical hieroglyphs. I mean, I do read and write music, but I didn't really have, I didn't have any score paper or anything. I just noted it down. And then I woke up the bass player, Mike Howlett, and I said, hey, listen to this, and I sang it to him. And he said, wow, that's fantastic. Let's go to the rehearsal room now. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> and we started playing it with the band, and that's how it, that's how it was, that's how that riff was born. Well, that's great how some things just kind of come to you in a dream almost. You know, that's... It did, yeah. That, that's some it of the... Just, it just, it was inserted into my being. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, that's that's what, that's what I would say. You know, that that's just awesome. Well, thank you ever inserted it into me. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> although, although from a gong point of view, we we would of course say that the Oxy Doctors was a transmission from the Oxy Doctors. <laughs> well, bring it on. <laughs> You know, <laughs> please, I'm, a, I'm an open conduit, you know. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your solo, some of your solo albums, um, you know, Fish Rising and L. And I was curious, what inspired you to originally do Fish Rising? Was it just, did you have a collection of songs that felt like they didn't quite work with Gong and you were kind of itching to do something separate or or what? Well, I wasn't. I was never in. I was never itching to do something separate. I saw that as a sort of solo album. It was just sort of parallel, rather like David um, did a solo album called Banana Moon a couple of years prior yeah. to that. And um, but basically, uh, my first band was called Khan, K H A N. Yeah, fantastic and, band. Um, yeah, and and uh, that was actually. Um, on the album, I had the, my keyboard playing friend from school, Dave Stewart, played on on that. And later we formed a. We were going to work on a second album. I was working on it with Dave again, and we had quite a lot. I, I wrote quite a lot of new material, but then it all it all went a bit pear shaped, and um, it got very difficult with the record company and everything. And I got rather disenchanted with having my own bank, because I was only 21, I was young and I felt a lot of pressure. And that's when I wanted to start playing with other people again. But I had this body of material, and when I eventually joined Gong, I did have this whole body of material that 
was un- had not had not been uh, completed with Khan. And we actually, I actually used to play a few of the songs in, in gong gigs or in jams and things. And then gradually, it, at, at a certain point, I decided I had to make a solo album. Of course, Virgin Records had offered me a solo deal as well at one point, but before I'd even become a full member of gong. But uh, I said I wasn't really ready for that. But I felt ready to do it in... 74 after we'd done the U album, so I that's when I got it going. Yeah, well, it's become such a classic and you know, just some wonderful music on it. Um, I was always curious about the cover art, um, it looks like a, a painting. Can you tell me a bit about that? On Fish Rising, yeah, well, it's all based around in this. Um, I, I like fish. But I mean, there's also it's based around a, a, um, a sacred geometrical shape called a Beta Capisis, which also features on my album Green in a slightly sort of different form. Yeah. And I've used it on some of my later stuff as well. With my electronic music project System 7, I've used the same design in different ways. It's sort of one, something, it's something I'm quite attached to. And it kind of worked with fish rising because it's beautiful fish capacity. It's called Vessel of the Fish. Yeah. And it's actually, you know, important uh, geometrical figure. And it's connected to the geometry of the Great Pyramid and things like that. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you um, about the likes of things like Mayan ruins and Egyptian ruins and, and how they had an effect on your music. Well, the esoteric view of, uh, philosophical view of life in the universe has had a, an effect on me since, I don't know, since forever. I, I was a sort of a, that way inclined even when I was very young, you know. Yeah. Well, I, was in, I was interested in beyond. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And obviously when in doing music, I've, I've tried to sort of... Uh, I wanted to express that in music, and that's uh, been one of my guiding guiding forces, really. Absolutely. Have you ever had the pleasure of visiting any of those places? Yes, I've, I've been to quite a few, and I'm, but I'm now living. Uh, I've moved out of London. I'm now living. Well, I'm speaking to you here. I'm just um, a few miles from Glastonbury in the UK, which is a an important uh, sacred spot in the UK. It's where they have the big music festival as well. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, this turn, you know, some of the groups that you're in like Khan have been kind of thought of in hindsight as part of something called the Canterbury scene. And I was curious what your thoughts are on that, that term, that tag after the fact. Well, it, it was a, it was all a kind of interesting accident for me because um, we had our group at school that I mentioned, but for various reasons, um, the other guys wanted to do it professionally and I didn't think I was ready for that. I wanted to continue with my academic uh, studies. And um, so I ended up going to university and by sort of chance, the university that I was accepted at was the University of Canterbury. It wasn't a sort of, it wasn't even my first choice, but that was the one that accepted me. And um, I, we were already fans of Soft Machine and Caravan, and we knew they came from Kent, which is the county that, Can- that Canterbury is in. But we, I didn't know they were actually from Canterbury associated with Canterbury Town, but I soon found that out when I was at the university. And then I started to become friends with the caravan guys and um, got involved with some jamming and my guitar playing sort of all rekindled. And that was very much what decided me to leave the university and do music for a career. And so I suddenly find myself at the epicenter of this small but 
quite distinctive little music scene, you know? Yeah. Well, it's... I mean, we didn't call it the Canterbury scene at the time. It was just a bunch of musicians who were based in or around Canterbury and, and they had a certain approach to playing, you know, we were using certain chords and certain styles. Oh, very, and, uh, very much. It was sort of like jazz meets progressive rock is kind of how I hear it all well, these we didn't years even use the term. We didn't even use the term progressive rock, man. That, that oh, kind of came later. Oh, I'm sure, well. yeah. Uh, but, of course, uh, I introduced my friend Dave Stewart to the caravan guys, and then later when Richard Sinclair left caravan and formed a new band, Hats on the North, that was with my friend Dave Stewart, a guy I'd been, I'd been at school with, so it all... It all became a sort of interlocking scene, you know. Oh yeah, well I've I've followed. And also, also a drummer, a drummer Pip Pyle, who was in Hatfield in the North. He was also in Gong, in uh, played on the Calibre Electric album. And um, I'd actually started rehearsing with him for my first band, Khan, before he joined Gong. But then the Gong offer came up, and that was obviously a lot more attractive. So. Uh, Sure. He went off and did that. That's when I first became interested in Gong, actually, is when, I, when Pip got involved. Oh. And, uh, you know, Gong, Gong was sort of, you know, had big links with the so-called Canterbury scene, but we, <laughs> we were very much the bad boys of the Canterbury scene. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, all of that music has really aged well, and it's really quite highly revered in the progressive rock world nowadays and um and uh i followed dave's career pretty closely as well um you know pretty much everything he is part of has aged really well and you know i think he's a big part of that obviously are you still in touch with dave yeah, all these years yeah. later yeah yeah we're good friends well that's awesome you know did it he's had an amazing sense of humor i would guess from the beginning would you agree Say that again. I said, Steve, uh, um, Dave Stewart has an amazing sense of humor, and as I was just curious if that's always been the case. Yeah, yeah, we were, you know, we, we it kind of developed when we, when we were at school together. Yeah, he's got a great sense of humor. Yeah, he really does. He really does, and it's such a, an amazing yeah. approach to chords and such. You know, just uniquely his own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I was curious if you could share a few memories of making the L album. Um, I'm a big Todd Rundgren fan, and um, I found it interesting that you decided to kind of have a different team on this one, and I was curious how that transpired. Oh, well, the lots of compressing to a few short answers. <clears throat> I think I, I was introduced to Todd Rundgren by Chris Cutler, the drummer of Henry Cow, who I was uh, sharing a flat with in 71 72 in Milton Hill in London. And uh, I, got, I got really into his um, Something Anything and Wizard of the True Star albums. Oh, great records. And then yeah. I followed the I followed, uh, development of Utopia. And I, and I went to see them live, actually when I was still in Gong, I thought it was fantastic. And then um, also he came up with the um, Initiation album, which wasn't everybody's favorite, but with, with my liking of uh, esoteric philosophy, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Oh yeah, you know? it is. And I was thinking, God, I'd love to do something with this guy. He's, he's, he's amazing. And then lo and behold, by this time I had actually left Gong and I was um, not sure what I was going to do. I was, thought I'd obviously end up doing another album at some point. And then I had a, I had a call from the, the head of A&R at Virgin Records, and he said, hey, Steve, we've been speaking to Todd Rundgren. He's interested in producing you. What do you think? And I said, wow, you know, I said, to like, it's a Pope Catholic, you know, yes. Yeah. yeah yes, yes, yes. And he said, well, so I immediately started putting together some songs, you know. And uh, some of the stuff was stuff I was working on with Gong. And I'd already had an idea to do Hurdy Gurdy Man. 
And I loved it all too much. I did sort of put all this stuff together, made a few demos, sent them to Todd. He was very happy with it. And uh, a couple of months later, I was on the plane out to uh, Woodstock, yeah. New York State. Yeah, kind of his ba- his home base at the time. Yeah, it all it all happened in a, a it was a, it all unfolded in a, in a quite wonderful way actually. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'd say the stars aligned the, the stars aligned nicely for you for that. Indeed, they do. They do. They, as they have on several other occasions. I mean, I've been I've been fairly lucky, really, in, in my musical adventure and one of the things I've been very lucky is I've never had a record company breathing down my neck telling me what to do. Well that's that's awesome. I've always been able, I've always been able to do what I wanted to do and just about sell enough stuff to be able to be reasonably successful at doing it and so I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, I feel very lucky in that respect. Oh, well, you've shared so much great music with us. Um, you know, it seems, you know, I've found that, you know, it seems like you kind of articulated that you really wanted to work with Todd and then the universe kind of provided it. And uh, I think there's something to be, yeah. I think there's something to be said for articulating what you want out of the future. You know, it's almost like the, you are often heard and, and it's just a matter of, of, of verbalizing it. And throwing that out well, into, into the things, ocean, so to speak. Things, <laughs> yes, these things do happen. I mean, the, the only thing is, you you know, these things do happen, definitely, but you can't take it for granted, you know? No, well, it's almost like just you kind can't of... can't take it for granted. Yeah, it's almost like just kind of give thanks in advance, but not in an arrogant yeah. way, you know? Just kind of yeah. like, you know, you the know, universe... You gotta, you gotta, you still got to pay your dues and keep on your toes. You know, you can't can't get complacent and just expect everything to fall in your lap. You've got to you got to do your bit as well. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any me- uh, memories of working on the Lunar Music Suite? That's one of my favorites from the L album. Uh, well, that actually was tried out with Gong, and um, in fact. Uh, when this uh, wondrous box set that I told you about at the beginning eventually comes out, you'll actually hear some bits of it in some live gigs. Oh, neat. That, that have never been released or heard before. But I mean, we, we did use to play it, bits of that, elements of that. I mean, uh, I called it uh, 7770 Sander initially. But then um, uh, when I was I, I always felt I was missing a couple of parts, you know, and then sort of after when I was uh, putting it together for the L album, I added a load of extra parts to it, and uh, and then we had, had another stroke of luck is that um, a friend of a friend told us that Don Cherry was in New York. And he was up for doing something with me, you know, and so we, we got him in to play his uh, avant-garde pocket trumpet on, on it. And I thought that was an absolute master stroke. Yeah, well, he's fantastic. And yeah, he's kind of known for the pocket trumpet, you know, more than anyone yeah, else, no, I that think. Was his, that was his big, big thing. But he was, he was, of course, a big friend of David Allen from the past, going even back to David's beatnik days, you know, so he was playing Don was part of the sort of gone world in a way, because he, he was based in Sweden. He wasn't based in America, but he just happened to be in New York at that time. Oh. And uh, I think it's great the way where his trumpet bursts out in the middle of that, that song with the music suite. Oh, yeah, it's unexpected, and it really takes it to the next level. Yeah. I love that. Uh, what are some double bills that you look back on fondly from the 70s? There's so many other groups at the time that became such big legends and I was just curious if there's any that you fondly look back on. Other bands? Yeah, like, you know, Double Bill with Gong. Like, who are some of the groups you were paired paired with that oh, you... Group, groups we played with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the 
quite a lot of gigs with Tangerine Dream. That was pretty good. Oh yeah, yeah. But we tend we tend we tend to do gigs mostly on our own, you know. We don't, or with people associated with God. It wasn't it wasn't uh, we didn't do much multi bill stuff or festival stuff. No. Do you remember playing with a young Genesis with when you were in Con back in nineteen seventy two? no relations with them then I, I became friends with Phil Collins a bit in the mid 70s okay. and Brand X oh, and Percy um, Percy Jones he was someone I, I got on well with oh yeah did some jamming with him yeah one of the best fretless bass players ever pretty much you know yeah just amazing yeah so how did you wind up playing the Steinberger and how long have you been has it been your main guitar um, well, as you know, I, I kind of got a bit jaded with my um, rock thing at the beginning of the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and I wanted to move into record production full time, which I managed to do. And I was I was thinking, well, you know, if I start if I do guitar playing again on, on a big scale, I, I want to do something a bit different. And um, one day someone passed me a Steinberg guitar. This is when they first come out. So originally they did basses. And someone passed me, lent me one. And the moment I picked it up, it was like, I just fell in love with it. You know? Yeah. Uh, it just sort of seemed like it was like, um, it was like a familiar pathway but leading to new uh, undiscovered valleys. And... Um, I like the way it was small, I like the way it could carry it around easily. So the one, the one the guy lent me, I bought it from him. Unfortunately, that one was stolen. But I bought another one new direct from the factory in 88. That's the one I've still got. I've got a couple of spares, but the, one, the 88 ones were the one I really like. Yeah. I'm a big Steinbrenner fan. I mean, and obviously, the. I use it as well on um, electronic projects. Sometimes I do sounds with it that don't even sound like a guitar, but they work well with what we do. Sure. Yeah. And so from, from that point of view, I see it as a kind of techno guitar. I like that. Yeah, well, well, I love it when the guitar doesn't sound like a guitar. You know, I think that's yeah. some of my favorite moments. And. Um, where it's just it sounds like it could be a synthesizer but it, it's obviously not you know I, I think those are some yeah my favorite moments on certain guitar oriented records um what do and you and of course the other thing the other, the other really important thing about the Steinberg guitar is it's really really good for the glissando effect which is something that we developed in Gong, David did so much David to trademark sound. He ended up using a Hona Steinberger as well. We just find that the Steinberger neck and everything is just particularly good for the Sando guitar. Yeah, and could you explain a little of that to our readers now? If I remember correctly, it's kind of like you're taking like almost like a whammy bar or something and rubbing it vertically across the strings to kind of almost like a bowing effect. Am I right? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously now, when you use a bow, like with a violin or a cello, you're using the bow to create the string vibration near, in the area of the bridge, rather, you know, instead of the plectrum, you're using the bow, yeah. and then you use the fingers in your left hand to articulate the various notes and scales, as, as, as with a violin. The difference in with the Sando, it's something that was first discussed. David first saw done by Sid Barrett of the Pink Floyd, the original Pink Floyd, is when you actually place a certain type of metal rod on the neck and rub it on the neck of the guitar, and up and down the neck of the guitar, it actually makes the notes that are on the neck. So it's actually, it's not the same as a bow, it's sort of, it actually sort of creates sound and you move it up and down the neck and you can play scales and chords and, and it makes a very serial sound. You need to, 
offset the scratchiness by various techniques of compression, echo, delay, and uh, EQ, and yes, sort of, you know, it's a, well, quite a bit of technical jiggery poetry. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's very much the archetype of gong sound, the sound of guitar. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's... One, of the, one of the great things as well about the, um, going back to the Amsterdam event, where we did the gong set, of course we did lots of other sets over that weekend. They, all the members did their own solo projects. And also, we did a thing called the Glissando Orchestra. We had seven guitarists all playing um, improvising the glissando in, in various keys, following David's um, seven drones. That was absolutely fantastic. That was the first time we did it. Oh, yeah. Did you do that at Nearfest as well? I feel like I saw something like that. Uh, I, think, yeah, I, think it's, I think it's out of the... I'm not sure if it's out of a DVD or an album, but it is, it is available. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I saw that. Well, that's the brilliant idea. I mean, it's no... on a uh, small label, small label called Dakini Records, I think. Yeah. What are you using for amplification these days? Um, I, I very much attached Fender amps, Fender Twin. Oh yeah. Just to, uh, well, friend, 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 so I, I like the ones that don't have a master volume control because I don't. I I like a completely clean, loud amp. I don't want to use distortion from the amp. I want it, all that to be made by my effects unit. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm like that as well. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just want the amp to be clear and loud and bright and blasted out. And, and I mean, the AC30s are quite light, but I mean, I'm very much a fan of Twin Man. That's actually the amp I used when I was in Bond. Uh, do you still play? I'm a Steve Hillage fan, but I'm Steve Hillage fan, I've moved up over to AC30s, but I've now moved back to the Fender Twin. Yeah, well, it's just a, a great amp all the way around, and it's it's wonderfully light and easy to carry around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's my only complaint is it is incredible. Yeah, it's in the, you take it as hand baggage on the plane. Right? <laughs> well, it, it's uh, well the fact they put a handle on the top is kind of a cruel joke because it, there's yeah. it's not likely you're going to just carry it around with one hand. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I've had a few in my day. You know what I did is I actually found there's a company called Jensen that makes speakers and they came out with a a new speaker with a smaller magnet that's as powerful as the big ones called Neo. And I put that in my twin and it made it about 20 pounds lighter and it still sounded the same. So I don't okay. know if anybody has ever run across those, oh. but you know, if, if you've got a roadie, you don't need to, it doesn't matter, but <laughs> if you're hauling it around, it, it's handy. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any, uh, any new solo music that might be in the works? Uh, well, actually, the other thing I ought to mention is we, we actually put together a Steve Hillage Band tour in 2019 in the UK, and it was really successful. And for, for the band, uh, I invited the guys in the current lineup of Gong, because it was the, basically the last lineup of Gong that David put together. His dying wish was that they carried on, and they're actually fucking brilliant. They've got a kind of whole new take on the whole gong well, thing. Oh, well, like, check them out. I know Cavus, and he's a, a brilliant. Yeah, Cavus. Cavus is Cavus is sort of in in some ways a uh, driving force. But the whole combination of guys are really good. They've got a fantastic guitarist called Fabio from Brazil. Fabio, who is um, also a brilliant glissando player. And great bass player, Dave Sir, fantastic drummer. And I invited them to be in the Sea Village Band for a, for a tour. And they were very happy to do that. And it was just fantastic. It was really good. We were having a bigger tour for 2020, but as you know, <laughs> Mr. Covid arrived. 
Yeah. That wasn't possible. Yeah, best laid plans. But we, are, we are planning. We are planning to do another one in 2023. We're hoping that things will be easier by then. And uh, who knows? Maybe maybe we'll do another album. You know, it's possible. Yeah, please do. That would be as, wonderful. Uh, as my uh, as uh, our dear friend Mr. Jim Kerr of Simple Minds used to say. Everything is possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I would look forward to hearing that when it, when and if it arrives. And, um, yeah, well, I, I wanna... mean, you know, give it, give, it, give it a few years. But it's certainly, you know, it's a never say never thing. It's certainly a possibility. I've got a few song ideas, but let's see. Yeah, we'll see what transpires. Well, Steve, is there anything you'd like yeah. to share with our audience before we wrap it up? Uh, it's uh, very nice to speak with you. Likewise. And, uh, you know, there's lots of um, interesting stuff coming from the gone part of the world, universe. And also, also the current lineup with Canvas are also coming out with a live album soon as well. Excellent. But they're killer live. They're absolutely killer. Oh, yeah. What I've heard has been really amazing, and I'd love the opportunity to see them live sometime, so my fingers are crossed. Well, Steve, thank yeah. you so much for taking a little time out of your evening tonight to chat about your amazing career, and um, I'd love to chat again sometime in the future. Um, I'm sure we'll meet sometime. Yeah, well, that'd, okay. be, that'd be great. All right, then. Well, have a good night, and uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you, sir. Good well, night. Likewise. Bye-bye. Take care, Steve.